Welcome back. You've had a chance now to think about why we study space. Throughout this course, we'll look mainly at the practical aspects of space, including what it's really like out there. In the last section, we focused on why we go to space. Now, we're going to learn how we go there. Certain elements or building blocks are common to all space missions and systems. These elements are the basis of astronautics, which is the science and technology of spaceflight. The building blocks we're going to talk about today are the mission, what we're going to do, the spacecraft, the vehicle we use to carry out the mission, trajectories and orbits, where we're going, launch vehicles, how we get into orbit, missions operations systems, buildings, equipment, and abilities, mission management and operations, people and procedures, and the space mission architecture, the big picture. Study this diagram so you can remember all elements of a space mission architecture. You've learned in some of your other classes that a mission, no matter how complex, has a mission statement. Any space mission begins with a need, like the need to communicate with different parts of the world or to monitor pollution in the atmosphere. To describe a space mission, we first need to specify the mission objective or why we do it. For example, the objective for a mission to warn us about forest fires might sound like this. Detect and locate forest fires worldwide and quickly notify the people they affect. Next, we need to identify the mission users or customers who will benefit from the mission. For example, if you watch TV at home, you are the user of the TV service and your parents are the customers because they pay for the TV service. The forest fire mission we just mentioned is another example. Who are the users and customers? We'd say forest rangers use the system and the National Forest Service is the customer. The third and last part of the overall mission statement is the mission operations concept that tells us how the mission elements work together. For our forest fire example, the spacecraft would fly in an orbit allowing it to see regions of Earth that experience forest fires. It would include an instrument or instruments that can detect fires. The launch vehicle would place the spacecraft in orbit. NASA would provide the mission operations systems and communicate with the spacecraft and the National Forest Service. The ground-based operators at the National Forest Service would work with forest rangers and firefighters to control and put out the fires. This is an example of the space mission architecture in action. Now, let's talk about the next element of space mission architecture, the spacecraft. Say you were riding to class on the school bus. In spacecraft terms, we call you the payload and the school bus the spacecraft bus. Your school district transports you to and from school. The parts of the bus helping you get there are the driver, engine, transmission, structure, batteries, heat light seats, and so on. The spacecraft bus cares for and feeds the payload. Let's look at a spacecraft that has two basic parts, payload and spacecraft bus. The payload, which actually does the mission we described in our mission objective, and the spacecraft bus, which does all the tasks necessary to support the payload. First, we'll look at a remote sensing satellite like the one for the forest fire mission, to understand how the payload and spacecraft bus work together. On a remote sensing satellite, the payload could be an optical or infrared camera. An optical camera is like a digital camera that you use, except bigger. An infrared camera detects heat instead of light like your digital camera, so it would help detect forest fires. The spacecraft bus does the housekeeping. It offers electrical power, points the camera, processes and stores data, uh, controls the camera's temperature. It also provides a steady structure to hold the camera, propulsion to keep the spacecraft in orbit, and communications. Now you know what makes up a payload and spacecraft bus. Here's another example of the payload and the spacecraft bus in its defense satellite communication system. The payload on the DSCS consists of the transmitters and receivers needed to send and receive information. Can you figure out what the spacecraft bus might do? It can communicate with other spacecraft and earthbound operators, control the spacecraft's orientation, and hold everything together. The two wings on DSCS are solar arrays that power the payload by changing sunlight into electricity. The large box-like structure on the center of DSCS houses the payload and the rest of the spacecraft bus. So, as we said previously, a spacecraft has two parts, the payload and spacecraft bus. But 
how do we make sure it reaches the right place at the right time to do its mission? In our forest fire system, how do we get the spacecraft over an area where there might be fires we can detect with our payload? We'll discuss this next. When you walk from the parking lot to your classroom, you follow a route or path, what we might call a trajectory. A spacecraft trajectory is a path that follows from the launch pad into space. The launch vehicle or booster flies a certain trajectory to place the spacecraft into orbit. We carefully choose this powered path or trajectory to lift the spacecraft out of Earth's atmosphere. The mostly unpowered path the spacecraft takes around a planet or other body after flying the power trajectory is called the orbit. The orbit must be precise to put the spacecraft in the proper location at the right time. The two figures on this slide show how we can think about orbits. The upper figure shows the orbit as a fixed racetrack in space that matches its size, shape, and position. The orbit or racetrack we choose affects things like the time needed for one revolution around the planet, the size and location of the coverage area, or what we can see, and the makeup of the electrical power system. Now, let's think about how an orbit works by looking at the lower figure. If you're looking at an object and can't move your eyes or turn your head, you can see only part of it. But if you're able to move your eyes and head, you get a much better view called a field of regard. The same principle applies to a spacecraft. By turning its eyes and ears toward Earth, the spacecraft increases its field of regard and coverage area, called the swath width of an Earth's surface. As the field of regard gets larger, we see more of Earth's surface. We see Earth in three different orbits, a parking orbit, transfer orbit, and the final or mission orbit in this diagram. We don't show the power trajectory of the launch vehicle or booster, but as we said earlier, the booster's trajectory often carries the spacecraft from Earth's surface to the parking orbit. Once the spacecraft is stable in the parking orbit, we may fire a small rocket and put the spacecraft into a transfer orbit that carries it to its final or mission orbit. A spacecraft spends most of its time in the mission orbit. We know where we want the spacecraft to go and which trajectory we want to have, but how do we fly it into orbit? We use a launch vehicle or booster. The launch vehicle provides energy, mostly kinetic energy or velocity, to carry the spacecraft from Earth's surface through its trajectory to an orbit. To see what it does, assume the launch vehicle is sitting on the launch pad with no speed or velocity. In order to put the spacecraft into orbit, the launch vehicle has to get it going about 17,100 miles per hour. The launch vehicle's trajectory ends with the spacecraft traveling at this enormous speed. This launch vehicle is the Space Transportation System, or Space Shuttle. The figure shows the launch of STS-95 flying on the trajectory and at the speed needed to get it from the launch site into orbit. What if the launch vehicle doesn't have enough energy to boost the spacecraft directly into its mission orbit? Then we need help with an upper stage that gets the spacecraft from its parking orbit into a transfer orbit and finally to its mission orbit. If the spacecraft needs to maneuver into another orbit, the upper stage may use small rocket engines called thrusters to propel the spacecraft. But how do we manage all these activities? All space missions need mission operations systems to communicate with and control whole fleets of spacecraft. The system framework supports different types of space missions. Some, like ground control centers, tracking stations, and communication centers, are on Earth. Others, like communication satellites, are in space. All provide the glue that holds space missions together. You can see here that flight control teams need equipment on the ground and in space, called an infrastructure, to coordinate elements of the mission architecture. In this example, the data goes to the space shuttle from a tracking site, which then relays it through another satellite, like the tracking and data relay satellite, back to the control center. This network then passes the data to its users or customers through a third relay satellite. This infrastructure may seem complicated, but study the picture and you'll see how it all fits together. In the mission to detect forest fires, the spacecraft's payload and infrared camera will detect a fire and determine where the fire is. Then, it sends the information to a relay satellite or ground station, which transfers the data to the National Forest Service. The service analyzes and sends the data to forest rangers and firefighters 
to battle the fire. To manage these activities, we need the part of our architecture called Mission Management and Operations. So far, we've concentrated on the mission's hardware, but no matter how technically advanced we are, the team members, people like you, are still the most important part of any mission. People manage and operate missions, including activities from the initial concept to the end, things like designing, building, and testing the spacecraft, determining the mission orbit, selecting the right launch vehicle, and developing the operations concept to bring everything together. Thousands of people make a space mission successful, and you could be one of them. At the very beginning of this lesson, we mentioned the space mission architecture, the collection of spacecraft, orbits, launch, operations networks, and everything else that makes a space mission possible. Let's look at the mission architecture for STS-95, launched in 1998. This mission was especially important because John Glenn, the first American to orbit Earth in 1962, became the oldest person to enter space as a crew member. The space shuttle mission placed three spacecraft in a circular orbit 300 kilometers above Earth. Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, handled the mission and ground operations, and NASA's tracking and data relay satellite provided the communications. Now, Think back to the slide showing how all the interrelated elements come together to make up the space mission architecture. Would you like to be part of a team doing these exciting things? We have a choice today. You can either research a specific space shuttle mission and then tell the class about it in the terms we've just used, or you can develop definitions for the vocabulary words in this section. Divide into groups of three or four and go to work. We're going to watch a silent video clip about the Defense Support Program. It shows many elements of the space mission architecture we've discussed. While we watch, feel free to talk about what you see. DSP's mission is to detect missile launches around the globe and tell our national command authorities about them. What you'll see is DSP's launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, rocket staging, the spacecraft's protective cover or shroud dropping off, and the overall trajectory. You'll see a stage vehicle placing the DSP spacecraft into orbit, which takes a while, and the spacecraft maneuvering. The spacecraft's white cylindrical front end is the payload. The spacecraft bus is the blue area covered with solar arrays, and the back end holds a rocket engine. You'll notice the rocket nozzle. Once the spacecraft gets to its orbit location well above Earth, it prepares to see most regions surrounding the U.S. by orienting the vehicle toward Earth. When the spacecraft begins operating, you can see the payload's field of regard, shown as a gray cone going from the spacecraft to the Earth. DSP is now on duty, searching for missile launches that could threaten our country. <laughs> 